Good afternoon. Good morning. Welcome to the CMMC countdown do's, don'ts, and deadlines for precision manufacturers. So, this is going to be an exciting session. I know we've got a whole bunch of people joining, sort of watching the numbers tick up here, and we will get started in just a moment. Welcome to everyone that is joining. This is a really exciting session. I am excited for the one that we have here. So we are going to jump in. This is the CMMC countdown, do's, don'ts, deadlines for precision manufacturers presented by Paperless Parts and Summit 7. I'm going to do intros here in a moment and we will jump right in. All right. My name is Jason Luce. I will be hosting our webinar today. We'll introduce Jacob in a moment. I am Chief Technology Officer here at Paperless Parts. We are the number one quoting and estimating software for manufacturers. This journey for CMMC is a critical part of what we're doing and helping our customers. So I'm super excited to be hosting this webinar. Incredibly excited to have Jacob Horn here with me. Jacob is somebody who we follow and listen to throughout this journey. I'm sure many of you, most of you know who Jacob is. And so Jacob, if I could take a moment, maybe allow you to introduce yourself. Yeah, sure. So uh, you'll have to, uh, everybody will have to be satisfied with the static picture on this slide because I'm experiencing technical camera difficulties this morning. So you're you're stuck with the velvety base of my, of my voice here. <laughs> so my name is Jacob Horn. I've been working in cybersecurity now 15, 16 years. I'd have to count them up at this point. It's been so long. Uh, I started out working active duty in the Navy for eight years doing a lot of really cool stuff big sampling period early in my career across all a bunch of diff different disciplines of cybersecurity. got out of the navy started working in defense acquisitions long story story for another day uh, but long story short i sort of found myself down the rabbit hole of explaining nist controls in defense acquisitions to defense contractors rather than at the prime integrator northrop grumman lockheed martin raytheon level as DOD contract requirements started to become more and more stringent with their cybersecurity requirements. And as the CMMC program started to uh, come together, as it were. So I've been specializing in NIST controls as they uh, impact defense contractors trying to comply with their contractual obligations now for going on five years. And uh, my current role at Summit 7, uh, who is a uh, managed IT and security service provider for defense contractors is primarily to explain what it all means. Uh, I make content uh, basically every day on social media, YouTube podcasts, various webinars, in-person events, what have you. So if you have been looking around for information on CMMC, it's probably a pretty good chance you've come across some of the content that we put out there over the years. And we got a big old honking rule that we got to explain. So that's what we're going to talk about today and try to make it as bite-sized as possible. Excellent. So thank you so much for that. So I was going to now without your video here. I think there are a whole line of jokes you and I could go down. I don't know if your if your video now <laughs> is is considered CUI or I don't know what. Yeah, yeah. For for everybody's safety, for everybody's safety, <laughs> uh, we're gonna we're gonna leave the video off, right? Just in case. That's how that's how that's actually our our business model is inadvertently spilling CUI on webinars, <laughs> so you have to use our services. Gotcha. <laughs> so great way to kick things off. Thank you for your flexibility <laughs> with the technical difficulties. This is going to be a great conversation. I really appreciate you talking to us about this. And so, as you said, to start off, and we've got a lot of people joining this. I'm sure a number of people joining have been part of this CMMC journey and watching this over the past couple of years. And I suspect we have some people on who probably still aren't quite sure what it is. So I think a great way to kick it off, if you could give us the overview, what is CMMC and why is this so important? Sure. So the easiest way to think of CMMC is it is a verification program that DOD has established to ensure that defense contractors have implemented their contractual cybersecurity obligations. That is what it is. Uh, through the history of CMMC, as it has evolved, a lot of people conflate the verification program with the requirements that CMMC is there to verify. And they are two different things. So by virtue of accepting defense contracts, you are accepting a various sets of contract clauses that say when you work with particular kinds of covered data, you have to implement cybersecurity requirements. After that, CMMC 
comes along and says, we are going to make sure, we are going to verify that you have implemented those cybersecurity requirements. This all started because the cyber requirements and defense contracts have existed for a very long time. And through various analyses, audits, examinations, and major cybersecurity breaches of defense weapon systems and supply chains, the DOD realized that relying on what is known as self-attestation is not a very good mechanism for assurance, right? And so CMMC as a program was created to give the department assurance that when it flows covered data down to uh, defense contractors outside of government systems, that they can have some level of confidence that their minimum requirements have been implemented. This is why CMMC has three levels. The three levels correspond to a different set of requirements that are each obligated to be implemented depending on which type of covered data you handle, either generating for the DoD or somehow receive from the DoD. So if you handle something called federal contract information, which by definition, every federal contractor handles, <laughs> then you have to implement the requirements that are in a federal contract clause, FAR 52-204-21. And these are 15 requirements. They've been around since 2016. It's not a DOD specific thing. These are the minimum requirements for all, all contractors. Uh, and so that's CMMC level one. Right, You are a defense contractor, you've agreed to implement these 15 controls. CMC level one says, please let us uh, have some assurance that you've implemented those controls. CMC level two uh, corresponds to when you handle controlled unclassified information, a separate kind of covered data, you have to implement not 15 controls, but 110 controls. And uh, I'm sure we're going to talk about this more uh, as we get into the webinar about CUI, the nature of CUI, how to know if you have it, things like that. But when you deal with this data, uh, you have a corresponding set of cyber requirements. And when you have those requirements, CMMC says, please prove that you have implemented them. That's the lion's share, you know, 97% of defense contractors. A very, very small number of defense contractors will need to deal with CMMC level three which is an additional 24 requirements on top of CMMC level two. However, the jump from level two to level three is very, very large. It'll affect a very small number of companies, probably not very many people on this call, if any at all. But if there's any specific questions about level three, we can get into them. Just know that those levels correspond to the nature of the covered data that you handle. As I always like to say, CMMC isn't making you do the requirements. It's making sure you did the requirements. So that's probably the key takeaway for people is that it is not imposing requirements on people. It is verifying that you have implemented the requirements imposed on you. And, and that is such a nuance I know people struggle with, and I'm sure we'll get some questions on it. So love the overview. I see someone's already posted a question. So reminder to everyone in the Zoom webinar, in the Q&A panel, go ahead and drop your questions in there. We know it's a big part of this. I'm going to try to leave 15, 20 minutes or so, we're going to leave plenty of time at the end. So find the Q&A panel, go ahead and start dropping your questions in there as things come up. We definitely want to take time to answer those. So I love that. So with that overview and talking about the program, I'll see one of the big questions, you know, if people have been following this and now that we're talking about 32 CFR has now dropped. And so we're looking at our timelines and what's happening. So where are we in this timeline? What do manufacturers need to know about where this rule is and what that means for them? Sure. Uh, I've actually got a slide here that I will share for everybody and we can visualize uh, exactly where we are. Or oh, you guys have it. Okay, great. Uh, so let me back out of here. So I'm not, I'm not double sharing, not oversharing here. Okay. So the CMMC program is one program but it is implemented by two different regulations. And so sometimes you'll hear people talk about 32 CFR and 48 CFR. What the heck does that mean, right? All of the policy around CMMC as a program, the levels, uh, the roles and responsibilities, the, the nature of the policy itself is documented at Title 32 of the Code of Federal Regulation because that's the address where policies live. <laughs> However, that policy gets implemented in defense contracts in the actual solicitations and contracts that you deal with via a contract clause. And contract clauses are themselves regulations. They live at a different part of the Code of Federal Regulations, Title 48. So in order to establish policy, we need one regulation at Title 32, 
In order to put it in contracts, we need a second complementary regulation in Title 48. You need both of those things to be final, effective, codified on the books in order for CMMC to be live and to be required in defense contracts. Unfortunately, through the rulemaking process, regulations are referred to as rules, uh, and the process of creating regulations is known as rulemaking. The rulemaking process for two separate rules are not uh, being done simultaneously. They're actually staggered from each other. So we now have the final 32 CFR rule in the top row here, which means that the CMMC program and policy is live. And starting on December 16th, that means that CMMC assessments are commercially available. So anybody who wants to go get an assessment can go get an assessment, or as we'll talk about later, anybody whose prime contractor is telling them to go get an assessment can go get an assessment. However, until the 48 CFR rule, the one in the second row there on the bottom, until that one is final, uh, then DOD can't actually put the requirement in contracts. So a mistake that I see a lot of small businesses make that enterprises don't make is they say, well, once it's in contracts, we'll get started. And that's a, uh, that's a, that's a mistake for a couple of reasons. One, the time from solicitation to contract award is very short and is getting shorter um, by, by the month essentially. So you might, you might have a handful of months from the time that solicitations go out until the time contracts are awarded. And that is almost always not going to be enough time for you to start from where the average small business contractor is to fully assessment ready, let alone certified. Because CMMC is a condition of contract award. So you can bid on a contract, but you cannot be awarded the contract until you have the certification. So you can't wait until it is uh, in solicitations to begin. You necessarily have to start before that. One of the other reasons why that's dangerous to start is that because assessments are commercially available and as there's increasing pressure from the primes on their supply chains to get ready, uh, more and more of your competitors are getting in line for assessment, right? So a lot of the assessment organizations known as C3PAOs are already booked out well into Q1 starting to get into Q2 for the queue that you need to be waiting in to get your assessment. And you can only qualify for the assessment if your implementation is done. So you can see that even though we're here in November and we expect that it will be in uh, in uh, actual DoD contracts starting in summer of 2025, you have to start many months beforehand on your implementation. Now, some details on why we think that's the timeline for 48 CFR. So. If you go back and you look at all of the uh, rules that DOD has issued since 2009, which, fun fact, I have done, <laughs> we have crunched this number, it takes DOD on average 280 business days to go from publishing a proposed rule to publishing a final rule. And so if you take the time when the 48 CFR rule was published and you add 280 business days, we wouldn't get the final in-contract requirement uh, for CMC until like October of 2025. However, the 32 CFR rule went much, much faster than average, like 30% faster than average. So if the 48 CFR rule takes as long as its big brother, then it would be published in June of 2025, and it would start to roll out in the summer, if you will. There's a lot of reasons to believe that the rule will go even faster than that because the 48 CFR rule is much smaller. The scope is much narrower. There are far fewer public comments. It's also not establishing net new policy. It's revising contract clauses that were originally created back in 2020. And so it could easily go faster than June. Recently, there was a blog from the Small Business Administration talking about the 32 CFR rule being published and they estimate that the 48 CFR rule will be final in March of 2025. Mm -hmm. So if you're looking at this and you're going, okay, that's great. We've got this program rule. And I guess that means CMMC is real, but it's not in my contracts yet. Do not be fooled by waiting until it's in a solicitation. But if you wait until you see the flash, it's far too late. And I think that is the key thing to hit on there. And people are looking at this timeline and I think seeing market rollout and seeing phase rollout. So just to hammer the point home, most of paperless bars customers and the ones that I'm talking to a lot, they are tier two, tier three in the supply chain, not necessarily contracting directly with DOD. So to make sure everyone heard it, 
when do you think they are likely to start seeing the requirements showing up in contracts with their buyers? Yeah. So with the primes, it's already happening. So we uh, we were just at a General Atomics uh, supplier event day the other day, and uh, I'll find the exact quote for you. But it was something along the lines of, uh, "If you are not uh, if you are not compliant, then we can't work with you." Let me make sure I have the right quote here. I don't know if we have it on the slide or not. Uh, I do. Do, 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 do. I can pull this up. But there was also an okay. interview with the Lidos CISO. Uh, as well as some of the other major primes. And they're basically yeah. all saying the same thing, is that CMMC is not a requirement to bid on a contract, but that doesn't mean when you're bidding on the contract. It means when your customer is bidding on the contract. And if they're going to bid on the contract and have a list of their suppliers, they need to know that you are ready to go by the time they're awarded the contract. So if the further down the supply chain you are, necessarily the the earlier you have to be ready to go. Because if it takes... 12 to 15 months for you to go from zero to certified, right? The prime can't tell you, oh, we need to send you CUI and we can wait a year. Oh yeah, here we go. Yeah, if a supplier yeah, so isn't this... going to be certified for 12 to 15 months, we won't be able to use them. They won't be part of the bid process because we run the risk of not winning that award if they can't be certified at the time the award is given. So- you can't wait until the solicitation comes out. And if you're on the other side of a prime, you might not even know what they're going to be bidding on, right? So you think so for shops that have long relationships with these buyers, and I think they're, I'm hearing some of them say, we have this great relationship. We've been working with them for years. I'm sure there will be some forgiveness if we're not set up in time. Sounds like what you're showing here is the answer being that's not likely the way that's going to play out for them. Well, you know, here's the thing, right? Is DOD... The primes, that whole ecosystem, it's not a monolith, right? This is what DUD policy says. This has obviously been something that the DUD cares deeply about. If you've been tracking the saga of C CMMC and its evolution over time, right? This is not something that the DUD is doing frivolously. So the bet that you're trying to make is I have a good enough relationship with my prime contractor, my customer, that I will be able to deviate from CMMC, from DUD policy. If you know that's true, then congratulations, right? You have a massive advantage. If you are not absolutely certain that that is the case, then you are taking a massive risk. And business, listen, no no, no uh, judgment here, right? Business is about taking risk. But you need to understand the risk that you're taking by assuming that you will be given exceptions or waivers or special treatment when that is not what DOD policy prescribes and that is not what the primes are currently saying if you have some sort of specific relationship then definitely leverage it if you haven't heard from your prime in a while <laughs> and you've got some <laughs> competitors that do things that are very similar to you then you should probably start you know sending cookies and giving them a phone call to to see like just how good is this relationship just how much are they willing to try to bend the rules for you because dod certainly won't you know, are there exceptions for small businesses that can apply? There the are no, yeah, there are no exceptions for small business. There are no exceptions. So the, the, the requirements that are verified by CMMC are considered minimum standards. And in the 470 page long final rule, they repeat a phrase many, many times in previous rulemaking in previous years, 2016, 2013, 2011, go all the way back to the very beginning when they were starting to create the requirements that CMMC now tries to verify, they say the same thing over and over again. The value of the data does not diminish just because the size of the organization handling it gets smaller. Therefore, the minimum baseline for protecting the data does also not decrease with the size of the organization handling it. That makes sense, but it's a little bit regressive, right? Because the smaller you are, <laughs> the bigger the baseline is on a relative basis. The larger you are, the less of a hit the minimum baseline happens to be. And it's it's unfair and uh, it's like a flat tax, right? I mean, it's, just, it's expensive to be small when you experience a cybersecurity incident. It's expensive to be small when you try to prevent a cybersecurity incident because that's just one of the, with the downsides of, of being smaller. So yeah, there are no exceptions for small businesses. And that's not to give everybody to totally dash your hopes and dreams. There are some distinct advantages of being small as well when you talk about understanding the data, 
the fewer number of assets that need to be controlled, uh, the smaller scope of an assessment. Uh, there are some distinct advantages, but the, the number of requirements don't decrease just because you're smaller. I think that's such a critical distinction. And so, so hopefully now we're getting across, reminding people how critical it is, what this timeline looks like, that this is coming, this is showing up in contracts. In the intro, you touched on the assessments. And so this is one of the things we talk to customers about most. So I'd love to circle back and kind of re-ask a question around this around the assessments and the timing of assessments. And so you touched on the challenge of assessors and getting the number of assessors in. If a shop now, and I'm sure we have a bunch on here who are aware of CMMC, but they aren't necessarily too far along, they haven't really thought about getting an assessment in at this point, what does that timeline likely look like for them? When they start thinking about getting an assessment. Is it, should they be doing it now? Are they too late? Do they have months to wait before they should be thinking about it? Yeah, you definitely. So if you're fully implemented and you're ready to go, ready to get your assessment, right? The final rule was the signal for you to schedule your assessment. And so a lot of the C3 PAOs that we know uh, that our clients have worked with, you know, in the interim period leading up to the final rule, uh, a lot of them are booked out through April, May of 2025. And so wow. if CMMC requirements start to show up in contracts, June, July, August, then they're kind of right on schedule. If you haven't implemented the requirements yet, which is the entire reason why CMMC as a program exists, then you are very far behind, right? You're very far behind. And a lot of people focus on the number of assessors, the constraint on assessment capacity. And that's another mistake that I see a lot of people make when they aren't fully implemented, right? The assessment capacity is an issue if you're ready for an assessment. The vast majority of companies in the defense industrial base are not ready for assessment because they haven't implemented the requirements. And that introduces a different constraint, which is the implementation constraint, because most companies aren't going to be doing this work entirely in-house. They're going to work with an outsource provider like Summit 7, for instance, and the outsource provider that you go with themselves have backlogs. Our backlog to kick off projects now is growing into the six to eight week range. So wow. you start to get into the holidays and now your implementation might not be able to start until February, right? Your implementation project, your transformation, all the things you need to do could take you six, nine, 12 months. And then by the time you're ready for an assessment, there may not be an assessment backlog but you will probably have missed out on quite a bit of DOD work um, because there are a lot of people in line. There's a lot of people that will have their certifications. So it's, a, it's another one of these risks, right? Do you have a good enough relationship with your customer in order to take the gamble? Do you have enough uh, runway and backlog of work that you could go a couple months without any awards or any additional work while you get all of your ducks in a row? Uh, if you're not sure of both of those things, then hedging the bet is implementing the requirements that are in the contracts, getting the certification that DOD has clearly been signaling is the thing that they really, really care about for several years now. That's excellent. All right. So let's shift gears a little bit here. Talking about timeline, we're talking about the program. So see, one of the big phrases here is CUI. And I know when you and I spoke about this, we could we could do an entire webinar on CUI. Oh, yeah. Probably will make sense, but maybe to hit on a few things at a high level, so many of our customers I know I'm talking to have been used to dealing with ITAR for years. And I think what they end up saying is, well, I don't know that I have CUI. I think I'm just managing ITAR. So I don't know if this whole thing really applies to me. Can you give kind of the 30,000 foot view, either reminder, maybe it's the first time they've heard it as far as what is the difference between ITAR and CUI? Sure. So CUI, Controlled and Classified Information, is an umbrella term that is used for any type of unclassified information that the executive branch entities generate that has a protection requirement. So the Department of State has export controlled information. It's unclassified information that has some level or stipulation around this data needs to be protected. The DOD has technical information around schematics, blueprints, engineering information that gets flowed into the supply chain that needs to have some level of protection to it. The IRS, 
uh, the Department of Interior. All of these agencies have all of these different kinds of unclassified data and through policies, regulations, statutes, all kinds of different authorities that have accumulated over the years, there's a requirement that says it has to be protected in some way. The problem was, was that they all said protect the data and none of them ever defined what protect meant. <laughs> and that meant that the agencies weren't very good about the ability to share that information amongst each other or with their supply chains, because your idea of what protect means is going to be different from their idea of what protect means. So they took all of these things and they said, these are all trying to do the same thing. They're all trying to control unclassified information in the same way. So what's the minimum baseline for all of these different categories? The minimum baseline is 800 So ITAR is a category of CUI. Controlled technical information in the DOD is a category of CUI. Tax information for the IRS is a category of CUI. Asylum and asylee information for the Department of State or for DHS is a category of CUI. It's not classified, but it's not uh, able to just be out on the internet, no holds barred whatsoever. So in many cases, when you deal with export controlled information, it will be a category of CUI. Now, like I said, this could be its own webinar. There are some situations, I will say this, there are some situations where your ITAR information may not be controlled unclassified information. We'll send some links out, I think, for everybody who was able to attend the webinar or people who maybe missed it afterwards. We've got a ton of videos, a ton of content on how to go way down the rabbit hole and dissect <laughs> the individual authorities for whatever data type you're dealing with in order to identify, is this CUI or not? The rule of thumb, however, is if you're receiving any type of data from the DOD that fits one of those broad categories, they're going to say it is CUI. And that puts a lot of pressure on you to fight back against that designation, right? This is not a this is not a fair fight because they can just say it's CUI and then you have to try to justify to them why they're wrong. Or you have to do that through an intermediary like Lockheed or Raytheon or Northrop, which is even more difficult to do. So uh, there are some edge cases and there's a lot of room there that you can leverage if you have the time and inclination as far as CMMC is concerned, though, I know people don't like this answer, but CMMC and CUI are two separate programs that are really two separate issues. Uh, and unfortunately, if you peer into the bureaucracy of the Pentagon, you'll actually see this in real time. The DOD CUI program is run by a different office and a different undersecretary of defense from the CMMC program. Both of those are different from the undersecretary office that runs all acquisitions. So you can imagine the left hand doesn't know what the right hand doesn't know what the left hand doesn't know what the right hand is always doing. <laughs> and so CMMC policy assumes that these issues around CUI have been settled between you and your customer, whether that's the prime, whether that's you and the DOD directly, because CMMC is there to verify the requirements that you're obligated to implement. So if you have those obligations, then you have to go through CMMC. CMMC is the caboose on the end of the train here, right? Now it has exposed a lot of issues around CUI, but it itself is not the uh, correct belly button to poke for CUI issues. Now, the good news here, I guess it's good. <laughs> good news, I guess <laughs> is how you would call it. Some, some semblance of good news here is that this, this issue around CUI will become more clear for a couple reasons. One, when, C, when CMMC starts showing up in contracts, the, the CMMC status, the CMMC level that you have to achieve will indicate to you that you will be interacting with controlled data, mm -hmm. right? If there is a level two requirement in your CMMC contract language, that means that the DOD is expecting you or your prime is expecting you to interact with a specific type of controlled and classified information. Now, it might not be right away. They might not know exactly when that's going to happen, but someone has made the decision that you will be working with CUI. In contrast, the current situation is you don't know if you're going to be dealing with the requirements because there is no positive indication in your contracts that you do have CUI. There's just this lurking obligation that maybe if you deal with it in the future, these requirements now apply to you. And if you didn't proactively negotiate that out of your contracts, then you get stuck 
holding the bag. The other positive note here is that there's something known as the FAR CUI rule. This is a whole separate webinar, but essentially <laughs> the Federal Controlled and Classified Information Program has three parts. The third part has been a federal-wide acquisition regulation for all federal contractors that says you are going to be handling CUI information, yes, no. If yes, you will be handling the following categories of CUI, bang, 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 bang. And that will be in all federal contracts, including DOD contracts. Now, this was supposed to happen back in 2016. We are just now expecting that rule to be published literally any day. I was actually hoping it would be published prior to this webinar. It should be published any day, almost certainly before Thanksgiving. That will help to clarify whether people are dealing with CUI. But just to maybe wrap up on this point, as the DOD says in the CMMC rule many times, um, they don't know if or when a prime contractor might be sharing data with you when they award the contract to the prime, right? They don't, they don't necessarily know what the data flow is going to look like. That's a decision at the prime level. And a lot of times the primes don't know ahead of time whether they're going to be sending you CUI or not. Uh, and, and sometimes they can't know, which is why you see them uh, saying you need to get ready ahead of time because we can't wait until we know for you to then take a year or a year and a half to be able to start handling the data. And that means that you need to necessarily be able to implement the requirements and get certified without having the data at all. So if you're currently a defense contractor, you have a bit of an advantage here because there are some scripts you can run. There are some technical things you can do. Like I said, we'll provide the resources to everybody on the back end to explore these options. Uh, but for instance, if you're a new entrant and you have never dealt with the data at all, you have to kind of imagine what the data flow would look like and start from scratch. So although it is frustrating to not know exactly what it is and what it looks like, um, you know, that you can leverage that position to your advantage. So even if shops haven't seen CUI from a particular upstream buyer, and that language is in their contract that they need to meet the standards. It is still their obligation to get CMMC certified and be ready, whether that CUI actually comes into their system in the future or not. Well, it depends on how much you want to negotiate, right? <laughs> so the current language that is being flowed to defense contractors from the DOD or from the primes is in a, is in a contract clause called DFARS 252-204-7012. And that says... If you are handling controlled and classified information, then you need to implement these NIST cybersecurity requirements. CMMC says, if you need to implement those NIST cybersecurity requirements, then you need to prove that you have implemented it, right? So if you currently are a contractor or a defense contractor and you don't deal with CUI, then you don't have to implement the requirements. The problem is, is that by virtue of accepting the contract clause, and I'm not an attorney, so I'll save, <laughs> save, your, save your tomato throwing for a different webinar with, with Jason here, right? Uh, <laughs> by virtue of accepting the contract clause language, right, you have inadvertently cornered yourself into a position where you have to negotiate the language out, right? If you go far enough back in the rulemaking process circa 2013, the DOD actually decided to make this contract clause go in by default, whether or not the data was involved with the contract, right? You would imagine, well, if the, for instance, let me back up for a second. The CMMC language is going to work where if you're going to be dealing with the data, then you need level one. If you're going to be dealing with this type of data, then you need level two. You would think that that would be the current way that the clause works, but that isn't the current way that the clause works. 7012 goes in all DOD contracts by default, but the controlled data that, uh, that triggers it does not go in all DOD contracts. So it's on you by virtue of deciding to work with the DOD to tell them to take the contract clause out. And if you don't, then they're gonna turn around like they are now and say, well, you accepted this contract clause, which means you've attested to implementing the requirements, which means you need to go get CMMC. And it's a very, very difficult situation to reverse if you, like most people, have ended up in that situation. So long story short, yes. <laughs> Even if you don't currently have the data, you're probably going to get forced into implementing the requirements because if for any reason your customer needs to send it to you in the future, 
they need to know ahead of time that you can protect it. Right. So we are, as paperless parts in this program, we are a cloud service provider. So I know, again, we've done webinars on this. This is a whole webinar by itself. But what are the main things when you're talking to shops, one, two, three things they need to look for out of their CSPs? What do they need to be asking yeah. their CSPs as they're prepping to go down or are going down their CMS sure. feature? So again, could be its own webinar, right? Mm -hmm. I'll just say that when you're dealing with the DOD's data, you have different requirements depending on where that data goes. If you're going to put the DOD's data in the cloud, you have a different set of requirements that you need to make sure are used to protect that data than when it's in your network, in your organization, right? When the data is being handled inside your organization, you have to implement the requirements in the NIST standard 800-171, so on and so forth. If you put that same data in the cloud, then if the DOD were to put that data in the cloud, it has to be what's known as FedRAMP moderate, which is a significantly much, much bigger standard for protecting data, right? Back in 2016, when they were creating these contract clauses, they said, okay, listen, you as the contractor don't always have access to FedRAMP certified uh, services. And we don't want to lock you out of using cloud services. So if you put our data in the cloud, please make sure that it's at least equivalent to FedRAMP. But they never explained what equivalent meant. <laughs> <laughs> now, starting in January, they've started to clarify what equivalent meant. And it's a big, long list of stuff. So the rule of thumb here is if you're working with a cloud-like provider, a cloud service, a cloud provider, a cloud offering, anything that's cloudy at all, then they need to be able to answer questions around FedRAMP uh, protections rather than CMMC protections, right? Paperless does a good job of this and not all cloud services and offerings do that. So a lot of times you'll see cloud ERP systems in the manufacturing space talk about, oh, we satisfy CMMC requirements. That's not the standard you're looking for. <laughs> you need to yeah. hear them talk about why they satisfy FedRAMP requirements. They don't have to be FedRAMP certified, but they do need to be able to speak to those FedRAMP requirements. It's a big rabbit hole. It's a lot to know. Just realize there's a separate standard for DOD's data in the cloud versus DOD's data in your house. And I want to get into our Q&A. We've got a bunch of questions come up here. I think maybe before we get into the Q&A, is there all these things said, is there kind of one thing that you would leave people with kind of the, the bottom line to all these answers that you've given that you'd like to share with people before we jump in and get people's direct questions here? Um, yeah, I would say it's not a joke anymore, right? The CMMC policy is official. Uh, I would say that um, maybe, maybe, I'll, maybe I'll put it this way. There are no waivers for CMMC for individual companies. The waivers for CMMC occur at the contract level, not the contractor level. And so, as they say in the rule, when a CMMC requirement shows up in a solicitation at that point, there is no mechanism for removing it. And so, your uphill battle of negotiating clauses out of your contracts, your uphill battle for negotiating special treatment from the primes, your uphill battle for getting waivers taken out of solicitations by a DOD service acquisition executive prior to it hitting the street are probably not attainable for 99% of the companies in the DIB. So it's far, far easier to just implement the requirements, get the CMMC status, and then take all the work from the companies that either don't want to or can't do it, right? There's a lot of growth for companies here that lean into these requirements because that is what DOD is looking for. I think it's so great you hit on that. I think that is the piece I know I've seen and listening to everything you've said and talking to our customers is this, this burden the DOD has thrust upon people. And it certainly is a lot of work. It's challenging. But I think the thing you said there is such a great message to leave. People, this is opportunity. The people oh, yeah. that can successfully compete in this space are differentiated. And so I think that's it's a great thing to anchor people on is regulations, requirements, they're always going to exist in these ecosystems. And looking at it as the opportunity and not this this undue burden, I think, is where we're really going to see the, the shops that thrive. So I think yeah. that's super exciting. Yeah, absolutely. All right. We have a bunch of questions that have come in. I know this is one of the best parts. People want to hear what you have to say. So let me, one question right off the bat here is, I've heard stated the combination of part number 
Prime and part number description is CUI true or false? Um, not necessarily, not necessarily. <laughs> so, so what makes something CUI or not is a matter of actual codified authority, right? Something is CUI if a law policy government wide regulation says this type of data must be protected. When an authority on the books, whether that's a statute, a regulation, an acquisition regulation, a policy document, whatever, when it says in black and white, this type of data must be protected, then it is considered to be a category of CUI. So if you go online, you can just Google the NARA CUI registry. This is a database of all of the existing authorities on the books across the government that says, here in this authority, it says protect this type of data. The mistake that people make is they read the summary description of <laughs> CUI categories and they go, oh, technical information. This looks technical, therefore it's CUI. However, if you scroll down and you actually read the regulation, it'll say this specific type of technical data is what CUI is. And a lot of times you'll go, oh, this thing they're telling me is CUI is clearly not CUI. Then you have a decision to make. Do you want to push back on your customer, right? Do you want to rock the boat? You can, you can do that. There are some very good consulting firms out there that save companies a lot of time and money by specializing in interrogating their customers about their decisions to mark things as CUI when they're actually not CUI. But a lot of companies don't want to push back on their customers. They don't want to be difficult to do business with. They don't want to rock the boat for whatever reason. And so at that point, you have to ask yourself, how much time and effort do you want to put into uh, dissecting whether something is, is actually CUI or not? You can do it. There are some advantages, but uh, there are some trade-offs too. So is part number prime, part number description CUI? Not necessarily. Is that something you can take advantage of? Not necessarily. <laughs> All right. Complicated answers to many of these questions. So... All right, here's another one. I love this straightforward question. I hear this one all the time. Question is, do you have to be fully compliant on all the requirements or a specific percentage of those 110 controls? Yeah, so um, the minimum score for passing a CMMC assessment is 80%. There is a specific scoring system that is used for the requirements verified by CMMC. Uh, I'm sure that we can provide everybody a link to the webinar that we did last week. We talk about this in brief. Uh, this is something to pay very close attention to. Basically, they split the requirements into three buckets. They say some requirements are worth five points, some are worth three points, some are worth one point. And DOD policy says none of the five point requirements, none of the three point requirements, and some of the one point requirements are allowed to be unimplemented when you get done with your assessment, right? A very small fraction of the one point requirements can be quote unquote unimplemented and you can have a conditional CMMC status, a conditional CMMC certification. Now, if you are awarded a conditional status, you have to implement those missing controls within 180 days. If you don't, then your status expires and according to the DOD, standard contractual remedies will apply. Uh, not to scare anybody, but there's a strong undercurrent of, of notes and references to DOJ policy uh, throughout the CMMC final rule. So uh, leaving controls unimplemented and letting your conditional status expire is not a, uh, is not a recipe for success, if, if, <laughs> if I could put it that way. So yeah, there is some variance in terms of your ability to get CMMC while missing some controls. However, it is a very, very narrow set of requirements. There's also some specifics when it comes to scheduling your assessment with an assessment organization. If it is clear to the assessment organization in your prep sessions that you just haven't implemented some controls, that's not allowed, right? You, you have to have gone through the process of implementing everything. And if they find that you're missing some pieces, that's totally okay. If you have just avoided the things in order to shoot for 80% instead of 100%, you won't qualify for the assessment to begin with. 
So the shops that are going in and bringing an assessor in, they should know what their spur scores is, is long before they bring that assessor in. Absolutely. Yeah. So, uh, you know, hopefully everybody is familiar, right? The scoring system uh, under CMMC is the same scoring system that you use to calculate your SPRS or SPURS score. It's the same weighting. It's the same usage. It's the same everything. And so if you've been implementing your requirements and you've been attesting to the government by uploading your score in SPRS that we have 100 or 105 or 110, then the DOD goes, okay, sweet, everybody's ready to go. Uh, this is actually one of the one of the arguments that DoD has waiting for everybody is when people say, well, we need more time to implement the requirements. They're going to turn around and go, well, we've got this database of all these SPRS scores and pretty much everybody in this database says they have a hundred or better. So <laughs> uh, so something's something's fishy here. Either <clears throat> either these scores are fake and everybody's been making false attestations uh, or the scores are real and there's something. So you see the problem that, that occurs here, right? Yes, you can get away with not implementing some, but not for very long and not for very many. So pay very close attention to the CMMC scoring section of the final rule. That's great. And thanks for that question, Andy. And here's another one. And Jacob, you are asked to prognosticate towards the future a lot. So I think we have a great question of what if in the future? And so the nature of the question comes down just going through an election cycle and looking at change of administration. It's the essence of the question is, what do we know about the way the DOD operates that tells us if a change in administration in the White House will have any impact on what is coming for the CMMC program? Well, it is, it is a perfectly reasonable question. And I understand why people ask it. I often think that people ask this question who maybe aren't aware of the origins of CMMC, right? Uh, the CMMC program was triggered by events that occurred during the Obama administration. The regulation was kicked off in the rulemaking process under the Trump administration. It was sustained through a change in administration to the Biden administration. And now Trump is going to come back in and everyone thinks, oh, he's going to trash the regulation that he started that was triggered by events that were completely out of his control before he ever came into office, right? This is in light of the first Trump administration passing an executive order that said they basically created the least kind regulatory environment in the history of the executive branch, where they said, <laughs> if you're going to issue a regulation and go through rulemaking, that agency needs to revoke two other regulations. And CMMC still made it through that gauntlet, right? The cause and reasons for CMMC being a thing are not arbitrary, right? These are not things that were cooked up out of nowhere as some sort of bureaucratic waste, right? We are losing the war. DOD is paying contractors through overhead rates to implement requirements that are agreed to in their contract clauses. They have years and years and years of proof that that is not happening. And we have massively undermined the ability of the joint force to be lethal in a conflict with China as a result. It has the armed services committees in Congress extremely freaked out. It has the Pentagon extremely freaked out. It has anybody who's been paying attention to the various compromises over the years and the resulting lack of implementation of basic requirements in the DIB extremely freaked out. So I understand the sentiment around a new administration wanting to come in and slash bureaucratic waste. CMMC is not the same thing. That is not what is going on here. I have a, a video, I will we'll provide the link to everybody, called The Fascinating History of CMMC. It literally is an hour covering everything in the lead up to CMMC from 2010 to 2020. And when you watch that video, I think people will understand, um, if anything, Trump coming back into office will accelerate what's going on with CMMC because he's probably going to ask what the hell's been going on for the last four years? Why isn't the rule out yet? I think that's amazing context and I will recommend that video. I love that video and it's just one of the many reasons why my teenage girls don't really ask me for advice on the videos that I watch and if that's things that they should watch. So no knock on you, Jacob, but I, my family hasn't been quite as excited about some of the stuff that I watch in my free time, but I appreciate all the content. One other, yeah, I mean, yeah, I really, yeah, that, that video has been, been, it's been great how much people have, have sustained interest in that video. One other quick note, quick, quick note about change in administration. 
part of the reason why rulemaking takes so long. We all know that this has taken a long time. If you know anything about rulemaking, you know that it's taken a long time. If you read into the history of rulemaking, the situation that we're in now is actually referred to as the ossification of rulemaking, literally like turning it into bone, the glacial pace of rulemaking. And the reason why it takes so long is that after many, many decades and many different administrations on either side of the aisle, all of them have come into power and said, we need more transparency in rulemaking. We need less regulation. We need more efficient regulation. We need more fair regulation. And executive orders and legislation have come through and established all these various things that need to happen. And so now, when you hear, oh, the Department of Government Efficiency is going to work with OMB, the people in charge of rulemaking, to make it more efficient and transparent and less wasteful, it is exactly the same thing that all the other administrations have done. And all it has resulted in is rulemaking taking longer because you have to go through more estimates, more analysis, more checks, more concurrence, more this, more that. So are they going to fundamentally upturn uh, the main way that the government implements law and creates requirements on people? Probably not. Uh, probably not. Nice. All right. We've got a whole bunch of questions in here and a number talking about CUI. So let me just hit one of these. It's So the question is this, it's saying, is this a risky assumption? Quote, all CUI will be PDF or discrete files. Then they're asking, how do you protect CUI if it becomes broadly defined as attributes beyond just a PDF print? Yeah, I mean, depending on the nature of how the data is flowing in your organization, it could be easy to isolate if it's distinct file types, right? If it's more nebulous, then you have to rely on a separate type of architecture to contain that data flow, right? So this is why some people turn to enclave solutions. This is why some people can deal with just strictly file sharing solutions. This is why some people have to deal with entire enterprise solutions based off the nature of the data as it comes into your organization, how it changes formats throughout your organization, and perhaps even how it leaves your organization. So it's uh, unfortunately too complicated to answer. Um, that's why I would encourage people to reach out to somebody who specializes in developing, designing, and maintaining compliant architectures to solve for this problem because you might be able to get away with just a straight up file sharing solution. In a lot of cases, it isn't that simple, right? Like I said, there's some, we, our portfolio now is over a thousand defense contractors. So we've seen all manner of different data flows, <laughs> situations, and types like that. Um, so, you know, feel free to reach out I hate giving people an it depends, but <laughs> when it comes down to what type of architecture decision I could I should make, that's a decision that could cost you a lot of money if you make the wrong one. So I don't want to I don't want to tell people you have to overscope your environment. Uh, that's that's definitely not what what uh, what you necessarily have to do. It just it it all depends on the nature of of the data you get from your customer, which again to call back can can depend on the quality of the relationship you have with your customer because sometimes. You can get a lot of details about what they plan to do, or you can ask them to stop doing certain things <laughs> that make your <laughs> that make your life harder. Uh, in many situations, people don't have that luxury, and you just kind of have to take it as it comes, which means you have to err on the side of caution with some of your decisions about uh, your tech your technical implementations. And this may be the last question we get to. This is one that really hits on something. I've heard a lot and shops are thinking about the costs it take to implement CMMC. They're concerned about the costs. So the specific question here is, is there funding available to help offset these costs of implementing CMMC? Well, I hate to split hairs. Let me do this before I split the hair. The short answer is not really. Uh, the hair splitting is that, remember, you aren't implementing CMMC. You are implementing your requirements in DFAR 7012 right? CMMC is an assessment to verify that you've done that. So a lot of times what happens, this is the reason why I opened the webinar with that distinction, is people will go, oh, the cost of implementing CMMC is $300,000, when the cost of hiring an organization to assess you might be twenty dollars or $30,000. So it is untrue to say that the cost of CMMC is implementation. Now, that isn't very helpful for people who haven't implemented the requirements. The short answer is there isn't a lot of funding options out there at all. 
And there are definitely not funding options for implementing CMMC because you're not implementing anything with CMMC. Now, there are some DUD services that provide uh, marginal benefits here and there for certain controls and requirements that you might have, but there is no appropriation uh, from Congress to help defense contractors implement their contractual requirements. Because it is a contract, because you are bidding on the contract, the, the way that that works is the rate that you provide in the bid is assumed that your overhead portion of that rate includes your cost of security. And that's why everybody's upside down now, because we've all been accepting the DOD's contract clauses without the appropriate overhead rates uh, to account for the cost of security. Now, all of a sudden, they're coming by and saying, we know that people haven't implemented the requirements, so please go through this assessment process. And people go, where am I going to get the money? And as far as the DOD is concerned, they go, well, we've already paid you the money because you were already on the contract. This is actually something I wish the DOD would talk about more. They used to talk about yeah. this circa 2020, where they would say, we want to pay you. We want to pay you to implement the requirements, but we can't because you've already taken the contract. So we technically already have, and we can't pay you twice. This is uh, maybe a, a more philosophical question in the future, but the change, <laughs> the change from CMMC 1.0 to CMMC 2.0 was a huge mistake for everybody because by aligning CMMC to the old existing standards, we now no longer have the wiggle room for creative accounting to say, oh, we have new costs to include in our <laughs> overhead rates. So you can now pay us for the new things by sticking with the smaller, more aligned version of CMMC. We're now cornered into your existing rates are supposed to cover for cyber. So there are not a lot of options out there. People definitely have to get creative. Yeah. All right. So with that, I think it is time to land this plane, pun fully intended. What are the best ways for people to follow you and follow Summit 7? Yeah, absolutely. So I post on LinkedIn almost every day, uh, various uh, missives about CMMC, everything from memes to deep analysis of everything from policy to specific controls to the technologies involved with meeting those controls. We have an awesome YouTube channel. We do a podcast on all things CMMC that comes out every Thursday. We just had a new episode come out this morning. We also do a live Q&A stream every Friday at 1 p.m. Eastern. You can find that on YouTube. You can find that on LinkedIn. Any questions that you have, feel free to come to the live stream and we will answer them uh, live on, on the air, as it, as it were. You can find us at Summit 7's website. We have an awesome blog with a ton of resources. And if you're really not sure where to start, if it, it, if at the minimum we've sort of convinced you that you should start, <laughs> we have a tool, <laughs> a free tool on our website called the Pathfinder tool. It's just a series of a couple of simple questions. And based off of how you answer it, it spits out a roadmap for you should start here and then you should do this and then you should consider this. And after that, you should move on to this. Nice, simple roadmap for where to get started. Free on our website. Uh, doesn't cost you anything. So a lot of resources out there, social media, YouTube, our website, our blog, our tools. And uh, if anybody wants to, feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn. That's definitely the easiest way to get a hold of me personally. Uh, Jason, as you know, I'm uh, on there all the time. So. <laughs> yes, you are. And for paperless parts, you go to our website. We have white papers on there keeping up with where we are, where CMMC is. Follow us on LinkedIn. We're posting as well. You can reach out to me directly. LinkedIn is a great way to do that. So on behalf of myself, Jason Luce, and Paperless Bars, I want to thank you, Jacob, for taking your time. Incredibly helpful. And thank you to everyone who has joined us today. Thanks, everybody. All right. Thanks, all.